Hello everyone, my name is Apostala Eddin. I make videos talking about my journey out of Islam and other topics related to the religion. Recently, there's been a lot of protests and riots in the UK that claim to be purely about anti-Islamism and anti-illegal immigration. I asked for British ex-Muslims to tell me more about what is going on. It was supposed to be a live stream, but I ran into some technical difficulties, so I recorded it offline instead. I attempted to have a similar conversation with another ex-Muslim YouTuber a few days ago, but it fell apart immediately once I pressed him on some of his talking points. So I thought I'd cast a wider net and get the opinions of other ex-Muslims, not just the ones with the channel. So without further ado, here's how it went. So Alien Blues, uh, thanks for joining the call. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you want to talk about today. Uh, well, I'm an ex-Muslim. I was born in Saudi moved to the UK in 2016. I've been here uh, since then. I've been involved in political activism, especially anti-fascist stuff, things like that, ever since. So the topic, I believe, was the reaction to these protests. And, uh, and the main thing is the fact that uh, obviously I'm opposed to them, firstly. Secondly, the fact that most of these protests originated from far-right scaremongering that's been going on for about, uh, well, more than 10 years, actually. Like, the birth of this started in about 2009 with the birth of the English Defence League, or the EDL. Their main leader, Tommy Robinson, has been spouting, uh, I don't want to say Islamophobic, because it's honestly just anti-brown people. Uh, it's not It's not really very much specific, specific about Muslims, uh, other than the fact that that is who they mainly talk about, but it's not really an actual legitimate criticism. It's just far right-wing bigotry of anybody who looks different than you. So it started then, at the same time, there's also the political party UKIP, who became the third largest party in the UK, who are also spreading the same kind of anti-immigrant anti racism. Moving from 2009 until today, that tension has just been building. Uh, the EDL has been mostly disbanded. It's been replaced by a new far-right group called Patriotic Alternative, but a lot of the same faces. That's a very common thing in uh, British politics where uh, the, the Nazi party disbands and a few years later the members just form another party. Uh, it was the National Party in the 70s. Uh, the BNP formed from the former uh, members of those. They lasted until the 2000s. Then the EDL formed from the previous members of those. And now Patriotic Alternative is just the, form the leftovers of the EDL. It wasn't really an actual protest. Most of the people who attended, um, so there were demonstrations all over the UK in dozens of cities. Uh, the worst ones uh, were in Middlesbrough, which is in the northeast of England, Sunderland, which is also in the northeast of England. Uh, but there were other protests, for example, in the city where I am, Leeds. Uh, there was about 200 people who came uh, to I don't want to say protest, but looking for a riot, essentially. But there were about 500 counter-protesters, anti-fascists, all of them, uh, shouting Nazi scum off, off our streets. It, it was, it, in most places, the counter-protesters outweighed the protesters, and most of the protesters weren't from the cities where they were protesting. They were bust in. But in some places, like Sunderland in the north or Middlesbrough uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, they were pretty serious, and a lot of them were local people. In Middlesbrough, for example, there were it was practically lynchings. Uh, they were standing at intersections waiting for our cars to come over, checking who was inside. If it was a brown person, they'd pull them out of their car and inflict violence, essentially. It's all over, and it's obviously bad. Like, anybody who would say that uh, it's good or anything like that doesn't really understand the political nuances of the entire situation. Well, some of the people who supported the protests and demonstrations to begin with are saying that what's happening right now is bad, but they're mm. trying to wash their hands from it and say that this is kind of a hijacking of the movement. Do mm. you think that everyone who attended the demonstrations initially, not, not the riots, uh, had the same sort of intentions and motivations, or do you think that they do have some sort of a point there uh, that, that is being hijacked? I don't think there is a genuine point to be made. I, th I think there's a lot of people who attended who didn't intend to riot, who didn't intend to do any kind of violence. Uh, you can't uh, paint them all with the same brush, but I do not think that uh, they had a legitimate point. So the 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 origin of the of these protests specifically uh, came from a stabbing that occurred in Southport, a uh, city in the UK, where uh, a Rwandan teenager who was 17 years old, uh, who was a Christian as well, uh, stabbed uh, 
a few people at a, a dance party, uh, children actually. So there were three children who unfortunately were killed and uh, a few more who were injured as a result. Now initially the police hadn't actually released the uh, culprit's name. That is quite common, especially for somebody who's underage, so he was 17. And so they didn't release his name. And uh, a lot of these far-right groups, and it wasn't any official news or anything like that saying this, but it was genuinely that originated from these far-right telegrams and far-right Twitter uh, that essentially went, it was Muslim, so, and they're hiding it from us. Some of the, the most common people uh, who are spreading this were Tommy Robinson, uh, another person, Nigel Farage, who was uh, the leader of UKIP, which was a far, uh, which was a far right uh, anti-immigration party. He's currently an MP. He's a member of parliament here. He went on a, a radio show recently where he talked about um, where he found out th that it was a Muslim. And his official answer was, I, f I saw it said by famous people on Twitter, like Andrew Tate. That was his exact quote. But it wasn't a Muslim, and when the new, uh, and before the protests even happened, the news had come out that it was uh, a, a Rwandan teenager who was who was uh, who was Christian and who was born in Wales. All this uh, hysteria about it being a Muslim originates from uh, the EDL's initial uh, message in the early 2010s, which was uh, there are there are gangs of grooming gangs for, of Muslims walking around, tr attempting to groom children and uh, force them into sexual acts. And uh, their other point was also the fact that uh, uh, Islam is incompatible with uh, British society and that there are no-go zones all, all over England. They essentially just labeled any area that's multicultural as that. These, pro these protests have their roots in, a far in the far right. There, was, there were very little people who were um, unaware of the origins of this, even while it was happening, which is why there was such a massive anti-fascist uh, campaign against them, because everyone knew who these people were. So what do you think of the accusation that people like you uh, who oppose that movement just label it far right and label anything they don't like as far right just to demonize it? What do you think of that and how do you qualify what, what is far right? This, this talk of demonization and it being uh, a far right movement is very evident in its formations. Uh, this was spearheaded by a gentleman called uh, Tom, Tommy Robinson, whose real name is Stephen Yaxley Lennon who was a member of the British Nazi party. Uh, he was a member, he was not even just a member, he was a leading member of the Nazi party until 2005 when he split off to form his own groups. Um, it was spearheaded by people who are uh, quite literally on the far right in the sense of they have expressed very racist opinions publicly. And by racist, I don't mean uh, shielded racism. I mean outright saying racist things like Nigel Farage. Maybe some of the people who attended weren't far right, but it was organized by the far right, which is why I call it a far right movement. I see. So do you think that there's any legitimacy whatsoever? I mean, forget about the origins, you know, let's just look at this without, without looking at the origins of, of, the, of the organizers and, and of this entire movement. Is there any legitimacy to concerns about um, the rise of Islamism in the UK, for example? I would say so. I would say to some extent there is a unfortunate uh, rise of preachers who teach uh, a brand of Salafism uh, that most people call Wahhabism. And they do it in a way that is very much anti-British society. But for the most part, they're not really violent. There are some sects of them. For example, I believe they were called, I um, actually can't recall what their name was, but there was a, a group who was openly advocating for uh, caliphates, for the Khilafah. And uh, these groups were, for the most part, pretty much uh, fringe groups. Most Muslims don't really associate with them. Uh, you'll see small pockets, for example, in Hounslow in London or in uh, certain areas of Bradford, uh, where there are Muslim majorities and these kinds of uh, opinions can, uh, for, uh, these kinds of people can have their own mosques where they can preach and on their own platforms. Uh, the most famous one uh, was, I believe, in Islington in, in London, uh, where there was somebody who was openly advocating for Daesh, for ISIS. So th there, there are fringe elements within the Muslim community who do advocate these kinds of things. They're almost the same kind of element who are uh, within, no, within white society, so, so to speak. Uh, they are the fringe, the lunatic fringe. They are people who are not really given 
uh, that much importance by most of the Muslim community that, that I'm aware of. So do you think that it's just alarmist or it's legitimate to want to stop such movements and to, uh, you know, stop them from spreading? So just because they're small and fringe right now or they don't harm that many people, uh, we shouldn't just ignore them. Do you think that that's a legitimate stance to take? Yes, uh, that's definitely a leg legitimate stance to take. And uh, they should be countered by more moderate Muslims, so to speak. And they should be countered by the communities where they originate. There's, there's a perception here that uh, a lot of, uh, that to speak against these kinds of things would be harmful, especially on, especially on the left, that you can't speak against Muslims mainly because they are a minority in this country. But there are legitimate reasons to speak against them, this being a primary among them that there are people who are advocating extreme violence or advocating a very uh, a very bleak uh, view of the world where they want where they do not believe in tolerance uh, there's that famous uh, paradox which is the only way you can have a tolerant society is to purge intolerance so i definitely think there is some legitimacy to moving against these people but i uh, but these protests definitely were not looking at that muslim uh, minority they were essentially targeting anybody and anyone they came across. They looted uh, shops uh, that were owned by brown people. There was even not a non, uh, uh, there were shops that were not owned by Muslims that were attacked. There were cars set on fire. There were people who were, sent, uh, who were lynched, who were dragged out of their car and had violence inflicted upon them. And th even the origin of the protest being, we want to speak against these people, it serves as an intimidation towards brown people at, to, uh, at walking outside. I know a lot of people who are just do do not want to travel outside out of fear that they might that this might happen because this wasn't just one day. This was a series of days, and then there were many protests that were planned after that. And everything after uh, last Saturday, which was I think the main day, anything after the uh, sorry Saturday before last, anything after that was was known to be incredibly anti-brown people. So as you know, I'm not in defense of this movement at all or the protests or the riots that, that came from it. Uh, but I do want to question what you think is the right approach to take to fight uh, Islamic extremism and Islamism and all the things that don't align with British values, as, as people like to say these days. Um, you mentioned that moderate Muslims have to fight those people, but that's not really always happening. Most of the time, moderate Muslims just want to live their lives and they're not concerned with the extremists among them and they don't want to take it upon themselves to go against them. So what else can we do? Firstly, a lot of the reasons these people are so centered, like uh, the Finsbury Mosque uh, imam who was arrested a few years ago, he was spotlighted by these new labor initiatives for bridge building between uh, the government and Muslim communities. So they move these people up into positions of authority within the Muslim community as uh, just on the basis of them doing bridge building with them. So firstly, I think any any kind of bridge building initiative needs to take into consideration the fact that we need to vet the people that we claim are representing the Muslim community. That's first of all. Uh, secondly, the British government... But is... who's we when you say that we need to vet? Oh, who's I mean the government, here? sorry. Mm -hmm. The government, before it before it spotlights somebody as a as an ambassador for the Muslim community, needs to vet them properly. Another thing is as well is stop them from being able to preach. The, uh, free speech isn't an automatic right in the United Kingdom. There are hate speech laws. There are these kinds of laws that protect people from being able to say certain things, and this doesn't seem really to be applicable to uh, Muslim hate preachers. In essence, they can say what they want about. Uh, go far about all these different things and they don't really get any kinds of warnings from the government or any kinds of investigation into these uh, things uh, partly because they're not widely reported but a lot of them post their videos on the internet it's not like nobody can go and look at them uh, so mm -hmm. that those laws need to be enforced a lot more strictly and I think that's pretty much it as soon as you hear somebody saying these kinds of things openly talking about it to go in and shut them down so I could think of a couple of examples that are more mainstream than fringe. Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa, for example, uh, repeating you know statements about how if they had their way, if Sharia was the law of the land, then they would do this and that to apostates. They would execute or excommunicate apostates, and they're proud of that kind of thing. Do you think that should constitute uh, hate speech that they should be punished for? A hundred percent. Like 
in my opinion, the stuff that comes out of their mouths is very, very aggressive and very, very provocative to people. And it should be taken seriously because the, the things they say about the death penalty, and they try to like couch whatever, sometimes, not always, when they're speaking to a quote unquote outsiders, they try to couch their language as an if this was an Islamic state, if this was this, but we were not existing under that is their implication. But obviously that is what they're preaching. They're just hiding it with qualifications. So it definitely should be taken seriously. So would you consider their language as dog whistling? Yes, exactly. Or stochastic terrorism, as some people would say. Yeah. But simultaneously, we can also consider something that Tommy Robinson says, or the way that he says it, as dog whistling and stochastic terrorism as well. Exactly. So I, I'm just saying that explicitly because it's, a lot of people seem to be under the impression that if you dare criticize Tommy Robinson or this movement or anyone in representing it, then that's because you love Islamists and because you're not going to do anything to fight the rise of Islamism in the UK. But do you think that's the case? Uh, no, not at all. I think they're both different sides of the same coin. They're both extremely conservative. They are right wing. They're very right wing, and they're they have very uh, similar kinds of intonations of provoking violence, especially Muhammad Hijab, for example. He openly talks about wanting to do violence on others. Uh, mm -hmm. They're different sides of the same coin. We have to fight both of them. Th there is no place for uh, intolerance if you want a tolerant society. And I have called out Muhammad Hijab's rhetoric many times in the past. Uh, the reason that I'm doing it right now with another ex-Muslim figure being at the center of the controversy is because uh, I've never come out and said, I support Muhammad Hijab and I admire his character and I think everything this guy says is great. So I'm not just singling out uh, Tommy Robinson or someone who supports Tommy Robinson. I'm against that kind of speech from any side. I just can't turn a blind eye to it when it's coming from another ex-Muslim. Like that's not an excuse. Yeah, hundred percent. I think ex-Muslim isn't like a group. You're not. You're not really associating yourself with everyone inside that. You are your own person. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is any kind of like you have to root it out within your own communities first. Is the first thing. Like if you see it in your own home, deal with it. So I guess the last question I have for you is, what do you think of? ex-Muslims or brown people who support such movements very vocally, uh, what do you think is the effect of their presence among those protesters or at least uh, giving speeches to those protesters? I think they give legitimacy to those movements by essentially allowing them to say, oh, I'm not racist, I have a brown friend. Th th that is, they are being very much tokenized and they there is a, a genuine element of, I can understand them wanting to fit in in a sense, but at the same time, you're not fitting in. You're just making it worse for everyone else. You are you are engaging with people who don't just hate what you hate. They hate you because of the color of your skin and where you come from. And they'll use you as far as they can go. But end of the day, they hate you too. If you were to speculate, do you think that such people genuinely believe that Tommy Robinson and his ilk, they like them and they're, they wouldn't be racist towards them or anyone else who's brown? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they, they think they like them, like otherwise they wouldn't be there. Uh, but mm -hmm. as to why they're, they think like that, I, I couldn't really say. Well, I'm wondering if there's any other topic that we didn't touch on that you'd like to mention that we didn't get a chance to talk about. Uh, no, nothing specific that springs to mind. Well, I, I appreciate you calling in today and uh, thank you for having this conversation with me. Of course. Thank you very much. Uh, inshallah, shufa gareeb. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> and... Uh... See, now, now you're giving legitimacy to the accusation that we're secret <laughs> Muslims, and that's why um, it's a, people it's, can't... It's, yeah. it's, it's cultural. Yeah. It's cultural. You, you say these things yeah. because they're cultural. Well, thank you again, and uh, have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Thanks for joining, Lama. Please tell me a little bit about yourself and what you want to talk about today. Uh, yeah, sure. So I am an ex-Muslim from the UK. I was actually a part of this sect called um, like the Ahmadis. It's, Ahmadiyya, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's an Islamic sect. Uh, some people would disagree, but whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I just kind of want to talk about this whole thing that's going on in the UK with, uh, you know, Tommy Robinson. And I, I just want to like illustrate to people that this isn't something new. Uh, Tommy Robinson pops up every couple of years, does something stupid, gets thrown in prison, uh, cries about how 
people are trying to silence him. And then it's just this continuous cycle of the same thing over and over again. So you weren't surprised when you saw Tommy Robinson pop up again? I was sort of taken aback because I was like, oh, uh, this is actually happening again. But uh, I sort of wasn't surprised by the reaction to some of the stuff that he has said and how he sort of used uh, the things going on in the media around sort of like alt-right figures like himself and Nigel Farage and how they're sort of using this misinformation to spread their own agenda. So in a way, it's not that surprising. Oh, can you give us an example of something that he said that he got in trouble for or some misinformation that he perpetuated? Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. So a few years back, I don't remember exactly when it was, but you should be able to find it very easily. He spread this huge media campaign about uh, a Syrian refugee child in a school and there was this video that was spread by the media where um, this student was like pouring water on this like kid's face and uh, uh, he had him like on the ground and this student was on top of this uh, Syrian child and, uh, you know, calling him names and stuff. And the media sort of jumped on it and said, you know, this is the child was being waterboarded and it was an Islamophobic attack. Tommy Robinson sort of went out of his way to... Uh, and this is this whole documentary that's come out recently that, that that everyone's sort of talking about. And it's why he's kind of on the run at the moment. Um, the sort of like misinformation that he was spreading at the time and sort of the court verdict that he was trying to cover and he was trying to sort of swing it in the favor of the student that was bullying the Syrian refugee. Uh, Tommy Robinson went to like court grounds and was recording a sort of uh, IRL live stream type of thing. And... Um, he was like thrown in prison for that. He said that he was thrown in prison because the media was trying to silence him and the government was trying to silence his his views or whatever. But it was actually because he legit broke a law, which was you can't record on court grounds and that kind of thing. So that's like a, a big example. So you don't think that this movement has anything to do with the goals that they're claiming it is about. Is that correct? What do you think their goals are? Based on my conversation with another ex-Muslim YouTuber, I'm under the impression that these uh, protests before they turned into riots were about fighting the rise of Islamism in the UK and illegal immigration and all the problems that it causes. Do you think that's what the, the protests and riots are about? Um, no. To an extent, it could be. But uh, I think... I think what a lot of um, this probably happens, you know, wherever you are or in the US, any country in the West where they use Islam as a way to attack innocent people who aren't Muslim or they might be Muslim. They're not here to spread Islam or anything. A lot of these far right figures will use Islam as sort of the scapegoat in order to attack um, immigrants like when you talk about i think you had a discussion with horace sultan and he kept saying like boat people they're trying to attack like immigrants who come here you know possibly illegally uh but they're using the whole like fighting islam thing as like a um as a defense of what they're actually trying to do yeah because these two problems seem like different problems uh, yeah. i mean the problem of illegal immigration or uh, asylum seeking is a different problem than the rise of Islamism. As far as I know, it's not the uh, illegal immigrants or the boat people, as Harris said, who are out there spreading Islamist ideas. Um, no. So the, the link is kind of weak there. So it sounds like they're just throwing a bunch of topics at the wall and seeing what sticks. And somehow it turned into, you know, racial profiling and, and all of that sort of thing. So, mm. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's 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 nothing new. It's it's the same sort of uh, crap that I, I've seen in the media my whole life, and I'm not even that old. So, um, it's um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's the thing. It's it's just nothing new. You know, I'm not I'm not here like defending Islam or anything. Obviously, there are um, some things in Islam that like cause people to behave in a certain way. You can't like blame every single Muslim who just happens to live in the UK for the problems like of a couple of um, Islamists. Do you think that this approach that the protesters are taking is a productive approach to fight the Islamism in the UK? Oh, no, 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 definitely not. So 
um, even if you sort of look at these Vox Populi interviews that they did at this recent rally in London, um, people aren't talking about Islamism. They're not talking about, oh, there's too many Muslims. They're just talking about these very rhetorical points of, oh, the government's not doing anything about immigration. Oh, it's these immigrants that come on boats. Like, I, I think that this movement has very little to do with, like, fighting Islamism. I don't, I don't have an answer for, like, how to fight Islamism because it's... If I say anything, it could be misconstrued misconstrued as me being one of those people who are sort of like siding with these uh, Toby Robinson and N- Nigel Farage types of people. So uh, I, I don't. But, really but we know that, that you're not. Like, well, I, know I, I don't I'm want not, that fear to dissuade to you from. I, I can reassure the audience that you're not someone who goes to those protests or riots uh, or, or supports Tommy Robinson. But th- that's the fear, isn't it? That people are afraid to be seen as extremists or hateful. So they just bottle it, bottle it in. And then eventually they just go to one of those protests. So I don't oh, want you to, to keep you, it inside. I want you to share your worry, thoughts. You, you wouldn't catch me within like a hundred feet of those protests. Like no matter what, bro, I'm not going there. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's sort of not the issue. Like I, I think the best approach is, is to sort of, uh, you know, dunk on the religion, obviously that that's fine. You know? Okay. So there's, there's, there's one thing you're, you're sort of attacking Islamism. That's, that's something that has a definition, but you've got to do it in a way where a regular Muslim is able to look at what you're saying and delineate it from, oh, this guy's just Islamophobic or he's just a hater. Right. You have to like point out the negative things in Islam that allow for someone who is an Islamist to uh, take on that particular worldview of like, you know, the way to treat women or uh, the way to treat LGBTQ people or like whether they should have rights or not. So I think what a lot of creators like you guys are doing is, is really good where you're still talking about the bad things in Islam, but you're still sort of like moderating those people that have inject have allowed sort of alt-right viewpoints to be injected into their like rhetoric about Islam as well. So I think more of this. I think whatever you say, there will be people who call you Islamophobic and there will be Mm. people who uh, accuse you of hatred and all that sort of thing. Um, So I I don't know the ultimate solution to all of this, but at the end of the day, I know what the solution is not. And what we're seeing is definitely not the solution. It's like you've mentioned, it's kind of exacerbating the problem if anything. Yeah. Um, so, but I still want to find a solution. So I'm trying to brainstorm by asking people who live in the UK, what would improve your life as someone who doesn't want Islamism to rise in the UK? Uh, is it actually as big of a problem in your life as it is, uh, as, as it seems to be for the people who are in those protests? You know, if, if, if all you do is spend your time on the internet in these like Dawa circles or these, um, you know, ex-Muslim spaces, you do get the impression that, you know, every Muslim you come across like loves terrorism and they just want to like spread Islam in the UK. Like that is such a huge misconception. Like you do get people in your immediate family that will talk about that stuff. Islamism isn't as huge of a problem in the UK or probably even in the US or wherever as people make it out to be. Um, you know, if the only way that you contacted Islam in your life was by watching a Muhammad Hijab video, you would have that impression, right? Or if you got the viewpoints of Tommy Robinson saying that, you know, all Pakistani men are... So so that's the thing. They, they don't say, oh, it's Muslim men. They say, oh, it's Pakistani men. And I, as a Pakistani person, hate it when they say that shit because you have these elected members of parliament who are saying stuff like our oh, Pakistani men, they don't have the same values as us. Like, they don't treat women this way or that way. And it's like, I'm sorry. Like I, <laughs> I was always taught to respect women in my life. And that was by the women in my life and also by men in my life as well. And I learned from their example. So like, you know, we, we can talk about it being like, it's about Islam and it's about the rise of like Islamism in the UK, but it has so little to do with that and more to do with like, oh, there's loads of Pakistanis in the UK now. And now, oh, those Pakistanis are also Muslim. So let's attack them on that because we don't like Islam. Oh, we're not racist because we're not saying it's because they're Mm -hmm. like Pakistanis. It's because they're Muslims. Yeah. So what do you think of um, someone like Harris, for example, excusing someone like Tommy saying, or someone else in that movement saying, you know, Paki or 
or effing Abduls or both people. What do you think of that kind of language? You made the hairs rise on my arms there, man. Like when you said that word, like as a person who's like been called this word, uh, seeing him say that, maybe in like Australia or like the arse end of the world where nobody cares about your stupid politics, like it's okay to call someone a packy. In the UK, and, and I see this so much, oh, you know, oh, you know, if I call a Scottish person a Scot, that's not a slur. If I call a Pakistani person a packy, why is that a slur? It's the connotations that those words have. And, you know, the people like this, it's it's just so ridiculous that a person who is so well educated and has been in this sort of like space where they're talking about these issues with, you know, where they're talking about race, they're talking about religion, you know, we're so exposed to this stuff these days that they don't even have the simple understanding that a word can have a connotation, though it may sound inoffensive to one person, that it can be like the worst word in the world to them. Like, I hate that. So do you think that aside from how you feel about it, because, you know, someone like Harris might call you a snowflake for not liking that word. Um, but let's let's divorce how you feel about it from the consequences of using that word. Do you think that some people in that movement, you know, higher ups in that movement using such words, do you think that it's more likely or less likely to actually result in resolutions and more likely or less likely to cause riots? I think it, I think it, it is very dangerous for people to like pass these like you know n word um, passes and like p word passes because Harris might you know he's a Pakistani person as I understand it he might not have any negative sentiments towards that word and that's that's okay like that's his opinion you know he mm. said that on your stream it's okay to say Paki he's so engrossed in this uh, in in this movement now apparently um, you know if somebody else that he met at this rally for example if they heard him say oh it's okay to say Paki. You know, he's from Australia. The connotation for Paki might not be the same for what it is here. But if somebody hears him say, oh, it's okay, that person has the P word passed now, you know, that word here, it, it's not a stretch to say that, you know, hate speech incites violence, right? Yeah, I don't think it has much to do with him being from Australia. I think he understands exactly what that word means. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. He just didn't really want to, he didn't want to concede that point because in a conversation with Tommy, he had mentioned mm -hmm. something about policing that kind of language. Like, I didn't even say policing the oh, word real. Paki, but, you know, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think it's about him not understanding. Like, as you know, he's, he's a, he, he wrote a book, so he's clearly, to some extent, uh, someone who has read other books, uh, mm. hopefully. So he, he's, he's not living under a rock. He knows what Paki means. But, I, you know, you know how I feel about it. I was curious because you are a Pakistani person or from a Pakistani origin. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to know how you feel about it and, and how you think it affects these these protests. And what you said is that it's not a stretch to think that hate speech causes violence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, what, what more is there to say, really? Like, yeah. OK, he he might he might be able to divorce the word Paki from violence, but his mate might also be able to divorce the word Paki from violence. But that guy's mate who hears, oh, it's OK to say Paki now uh, might be like, OK, well, I can say Paki. Let me just go and beat up a bunch of Pakis on the street. I'm not for policing. It's just have some like friggin empathy and think about like look back on history on how this sort of stuff has gone about. You know? Yeah, no one here is talking about policing or who can or can't say what word, but yeah. to not pretend like that word has no meaning and that it's totally okay. That that's all we're asking for. To not yeah. pretend that this this movement is uh, uh, or or that the riots have nothing to do with the initial protests and no one could have seen it coming when it was obvious from a mile away. You know, um, mm. that's that's how I feel about it. Sure. But I do kind of disagree with you on something when we were talking about the rise of Islamism in the UK. Um, I agree that most people who are protesting that aren't actually affected and don't genuinely care about the rise of Islamism. It's just a placeholder for something else. Uh, but I think that there is a problem when people like Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa get to say the most hateful things, you know, under the guise of freedom of speech and freedom of religion and not face any consequences. Uh, so it seems to be a, sh a safe shelter for them to some extent being in the UK. So that yeah. is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I don't think it, it will be addressed by flipping cars. No, I definitely agree that they they do kind of misuse this freedom of speech stuff to say like really mm -hmm. uh, shitty stuff, I guess. But um, what 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 I was saying was that they're not talking about deporting Muhammad Hijab or Ali Dawa. They're talking about deporting the average Muslim person over here. It on mass. That's what they. That's what 
I mean, I don't know what their ultimate goals with this stuff actually is, but that's that's the person who's affected by this stuff. It's not Ali Dawa's corner shop that's being attacked and being robbed in these riots. It's it's just the average Muslim that is just trying to lead a fruitful life in the UK. So are there any other topics or points that we haven't touched on that you'd like to mention? Yeah, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll try and keep this brief. Uh, a lot of what I've seen, um, I mean, I keep bringing in Har Sultan, but, you know, he he sort of, um, him, Tommy Robinson, uh, and this Nigel Farage guy as well, they, they, they all um, have been talking about this, like, two-tier police system that we have in the UK, apparently, and with the riots happening right now, they, there's a lot of comparisons being drawn to uh, the Palestine protests that were, you know, happening all over the country and, you know, all over the world. I don't know about them, but I was actually at a bunch of these in London and, you know, they're talking about how, oh, you know, you had ISIS and you had these Hamas flags everywhere and like these Muslims were just going around trashing everything. And um, yeah, I was actually there and I didn't see any of that. And, um, and, and you know, they say, oh, I was Muslims, but I, I don't. I don't remember seeing only Muslims. I saw people from, you know, all sorts of backgrounds, people uh, who are white, Pakistanis. I saw Indians there. I saw people from all sorts of different backgrounds. They had their flags. They had the Palestine flag. And they were just showing their solidarity with Palestine. And it's just a criticism of our government's actions and the hand that they play in the fate of the Palestinians today. And... I, I don't know how many people actually believe some of the stuff that's being said by these people with regards to Palestine protests. And I'm sure, you know, they'll have videos and stuff that they'll show, oh, you know, here's this Muslim person doing this to somebody's house. Um, but, you know, you'll, you'll always have bad actors in, 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 in things like this where, um, you know, you might have a, a certain individual who will maybe get too passionate and trash something. And, okay, that's bad. But if you compare the two... It's pretty clear which of those two protests or riots were actually more violent. But to play devil's advocate, you're saying that these people are hijacking the protests to, um, because they're too passionate or because they're angry and they, they riot and they turn it into a riot. Can't the same thing be said about those protests that are happening now? I mean, I, I, can't, I can't probably say something objectively, but... Um... I, I know people that were scared to go into the local town because of this sort of stuff. And yeah, I suppose that's a good point. But what's the core message or what's the goal of each of these? I can't speak for everyone who was there, but my, my intention in being there is criticizing my government, really. And so that's what the important thing for me is. Like, on the other hand, also, you know, these rioters are saying they're criticizing their government, but, you know, it's cased in so much hatred and so much um, discrimination against. Um, not just immigrants that are coming from different countries, but people who are sort of natural citizens of this country that have immigrated, you know, in previous generations and stuff. And so it's not just the people coming in, it's a, it's a hatred for even the citizens of the country as well. So, you know, we, we got to, they've got to really think about what, what it is they are trying to like uh, achieve with these rights and stuff. Well, thank you for calling in and giving your input. I, I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for giving me the time. Appreciate it. Hello, Gaia. Welcome to the show and thanks for calling in. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you want to talk about today. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Gaia and it's great to be on. First of all, I wanted to say thank you uh, to you, Aladdin, for uh, creating the space and all your videos like on your channel. I find them super helpful um, as an ex-Muslim. But yeah, going into a bit about me. So I am an ex-Muslim and ethnically I'm like half English, half Egyptian. So I've got a bit of influence like from both sides, but I was most definitely like raised under Islam. Despite being born in the UK, I grew up in the Gulf. So I had like quite a lot of um, influence from Islam, like in my childhood, I'd say. Um, it was very much like ingrained in me, like at school and stuff when I was I'd say about 12, that's when I started to figure out that, you know, it's not really the religion for me. Also, like, my dad, despite being Egyptian, um, like, he never really taught me proper Arabic. So, like, my Arabic's shaky at best. So I think, like a lot of Muslims, like, I never really understood my own book. So when I was actually old enough to then investigate, like, what is actually in the Quran and actually read it, you know, cover to cover, 
that's sort of when I realized, you know, this doesn't really align with my values at all. So, yeah, there was a bit of a struggle for a few years while still living in the Gulf, but knowing like I wasn't really Muslim. But then I ended up moving back here to the UK um, about five years ago now. You know, I've noticed like a world of a difference, like in just my mental state, I guess, like being away from Sharia, like where I was in the Gulf, like I wasn't in Saudi. So Sharia wasn't as strict as it is there, but still very much present and, you know, instills that fear in you. So I suppose like coming back to Britain and living in this society, you know, having rights such as the right to protest, stuff like that, it was a big change for me, but definitely a positive one. I'm, yeah, just appreciative of the UK, like being open in that sense, um, even politically. Like, it's great that we can have these conversations, I suppose. Other than like my personal life, like when I did get to the UK, I started to get involved in like anti-racist organising like in my community, especially like around the time of the Black Lives Matter movement. Obviously, that was more like US based, but it definitely started conversations everywhere. Um, and that's when I sort of started to understand a bit about how the political system here works because like here in Britain it's quite community led I'd say the way the media makes it look is that there's one prime minister and he makes all the decisions but it's very much not like that I'd say because you've got an MP for each community you're very much free to campaign with your MP to enact change and I think that's sort of where I start to have issues with the current movement that's going on with the riots because they're not really giving us any enactable change, I suppose. Like, they're not giving us any points that they'd really like to see enacted, which that's what I take issue with, I suppose. So what do you understand that these protests are about? So from what I can understand, and I watched your video with um, Harris Sultan, so obviously I, I gained that perspective, but... I think the perspective he was giving is like such a minority, even within that far right group. From what I'm seeing, like I, I live in Manchester, which is like a very leftist city. From what I've been seeing, though, the far right have actually been traveling into Manchester. So they're not even really from here or part of the community and just causing disruption, basically, like any, let's say, obviously Asian looking person on certain days in the city center could easily get punched up. Um, black people as well you know and it's super scary like just to see that kind of violence and to know that as an ethnic minority like whatever your religion you're not actually safe here all of the time because of these far-right people quite upsetting i'd say so aside from the violence and the mm. rioting what do you think they are uh at trying to achieve i think that a lot of them have unheard voices in a sense um and that they're trying to like spread their message i think there's probably two camps there might be a small minority who have some valid points that could be enacted into political change but then there is another group who are they've been known to be involved in like football hooliganism um like they've been convicted before they genuinely enjoy being disruptive to society and being violent so I think that, yeah, there's very much those two camps. Certain people are just racist and they see this as an excuse to incite fear, I suppose, into the minority groups that live here. So one of the things that they sometimes mention, you know, is, is a mm. core goal for them is uh, combating the rise of Islamism in the UK. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is Islamism on the rise in the UK and what does that look like? For sure. I, I do think it's on the rise. I mean, it definitely is when it comes to certain more secular communities. Nothing that I've personally experienced because I didn't grow up here. I wasn't going to the masjid here, let's say. But I know for sure from people that I've spoken to, like friends and stuff, that there are some very insular communities who have some very extreme views and like takes on the Quran. And I've also heard about how, let's say, if you want to get a divorce in Islam here in the UK, um, you're advised not to go through like the normal court system. You're advised to go and do it with the sheikhs 
which obviously ends up being very problematic, especially for the women uh, in the situation. So I think going off that as well, whenever like, there's a minority group, they tend to be a little bit more extreme just out of wanting to protect themselves, protect their community, which, you know, that is understandable. But I think sowing hatred and division is only really going to exacerbate that extremism problem because they're going to say, right, well, everyone's against us. Right now we've got to band together. And I really think that could promote more extremism, which is kind of where my worry lies. I think that if we, if these people really did want to battle Islamism, they could do it through policy. And I think that the best way would probably be through education, just making sure that the children who are in these communities understand that here in the UK, they've got different rights and that they can use our legal system. They don't have to go through their community system. Obviously, it's not going to be as simple as that. But I, yeah, I just don't see any like, actual enactable points from these people a lot of the time that we could really put into practice it's hard to see that point that they make it really is you know i was going to ask you that next what do you think the solution or a path to resolution what would that look like and you already kind of answered that uh, policy mm. changes and education which is kind of what yeah. i was trying to get at with uh, in that conversation with that that other ex-muslim youtuber but we didn't get mm. that far in the conversation uh, so yeah. th that's a lot more clarity than we're getting from people who support the protests. So I, I'm, I'm grateful that, that you're able to vocalize your thoughts that well. Um, so when it comes oh, to policy you. change, and I, mm. I, I don't think you, you proclaim to be an expert on the topic or anything, but sure, what's sure. an example of something that you would think is, is a good policy uh, to enact to combat the, the rise of Islamism? That is a really interesting question. It's definitely something that we all need to, like in Britain, we all need to think about a lot more. Um, I think what I'd probably say is, first of all, maybe trying to stop how insular these communities get. And I think the point I made about education might be one of the only sort of fair ways to do that, because you can't exactly walk into a community and be like, right, all of you split up now, because that's never going to work, you know, in practice. I think what we really have to do is change the education system, make it a lot more aware of cult programming, I suppose, and like how these high control groups get into your mind. Because I think once people are like armed with that information, they'll be a lot more likely to feel ready to sort of leave that community, as it were, or even make their own communities less extreme, I suppose. But I definitely think that reaching out to these people is going to do a lot more than sort of hating on them and destroying sort of everything they're about, if that makes sense. But in terms of actual hard and fast policies, it's hard to say because I think, let's say the hijab ban in France, I just don't think that's worked as they've expected it to. But I would like to see maybe in the UK like a hijab ban for, let's say, girls under 13, because... You know, you see a lot of very young girls, like I would assume they're about six or seven here, like wearing hijabs that directly sort of takes away from their freedom, let's say. Maybe sort of an age limit to the hijab, that could be beneficial. But yeah, mainly education, especially for women on their rights and their place in society, I suppose. That's what I'd like to see. Yeah, I mean, I mostly agree with you, but when it comes to forcibly making young girls take off their hijab, I don't think that would actually work. I don't think that a hijab sure. ban would, would work. Um, and yeah. in a similar you vein, like there, practice. there's no ban, there's no ban on, and swimsuits for, for little girls, right? Like that's, that's a thing mm. that parents are free to put their children in. So we, we can't, mm. we can't really force parents to not have their children wear hijab, but somehow there yeah. needs to be a push to, to, to lower the, 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 the degree of indoctrination and, and the, a girl's right to feel the wind in her hair. You know, that's her right mm. to feel that, but we can't force them to take that right. So that's the that part that true. I sort of, yeah, I, I don't exactly yeah. agree with that. Um, yeah, totally. Something to reflect on here is those protesters, do they really genuinely care about the little girls mm. wearing the hijab or the women who are being oppressed by the religion 
or the yeah. the majority of victims of Islamism in the UK, which are other Muslims, or is it just mm. an excuse for them to say, "Hey, that's that's a group I don't like," and I'm going to start ch- chanting slogans and flipping over cars till something happens? Hundred percent. I think you're you've hit the nail on the head with that. Like, I I do think there's probably a small minority who think that what they're doing is helping these people, but. I think logically it's really hard to see what changes this has actually made for the women specifically because you're not you're not going into the community and directly helping anyone you know and you're just sowing up more division which in turn I I believe just creates more extremism and you know that can never be a good thing for that community it's also going to stop it's going to stop people from being allowed to go out especially women because we've been hearing a lot in the media you know like if you're a person of color stay inside don't leave and i think it's gonna make it seem that you know if you go outside it's not going to be safe so muslim men are going to have more of an idea of you know stay inside for your own safety i suppose which in turn creates more of an issue I think going back to the policy thing again, I just had another thought. There's a lot of domestic violence shelters in the UK. And I think that something that could be really helpful is to educate the people that work at these centres on Islam and sort of how it propagates, how it affects women. I think that could be really beneficial too, because if there are people in the community who understand and can relate on on a level, then that's going to be really beneficial to the women as well. But yeah, like you say, I just don't see how these protests are really going to help in the actual community spaces that they're needed. I appreciate your your feedback on this. And, you know, especially as someone who lives there, it's good to know your perspective. Um, is, is there you. anything else that you wanted to touch on that we didn't get a chance to talk about? I think that really does cover it. Yeah, that's like my main thoughts for sure. But yeah, thank you so much for for holding this it's been really fun really good thank you for joining yeah and um i i appreciate your perspective and i hope you have a great rest of your day this doesn't cover all there is to say about the current events and it's not meant to be a comprehensive overview but it should give you an idea about the general sentiment among some of those who are anti-islamism while also not being pro whatever the protests are up to so thank you for watching or listening Like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And thank you to the patrons, YouTube members, and donors for supporting this channel. I could not do this without you. And as always, think critically and think for yourself. And consider watching one of these videos next.